go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's special webinar titled Implementing Africa's Commitments on Food Security, Agriculture, and Nutrition. Feed the Future and AgriLinks are very delighted to host this event with a special guest, Dr. Abebe Gabriel, Director of Rural Economy and Agriculture at the African Union Commission, who is here to discuss what is coming down the tracks as African governments prepare for the next generation of CADEP country investment plans in response to the 2014 Malibu Declaration. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'll be facilitating today, just kind of keeping things on track and helping facilitate. Uh, uh, the agenda will be fairly simple today. First up, we will have Jeff Hill, Director for Policy with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, uh, who will set the context for our discussion today and introduce Dr. Abebe. Next, Abebe will give a 20-minute presentation or so. And after that, we will hold a Q&A session and we'll try to address as many questions as we can. So we encourage you to uh, enter your comments and questions at any point in the chat box, and we'll be keeping track of them uh, to, to ask during the Q&A session. So we have a, a rich discussion ahead, and I don't want to take too much time with uh, these housekeeping issues. So I think we'll go ahead and dive right into our introduction from Jeff Hill. Uh, who again is Director for Policy with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. So I'll hand the microphone over to Jeff. Thank you, Julie. We're really very excited to be sponsoring this webinar with Dr. Gabriel um, as the primary speaker. This webinar is focused on broadening awareness of the implementation plans for the African Union Declaration on Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transformation for Shared Prosperity and Improved Livelihoods that African heads of state and government from across Africa committed to at the AU summit in June 2014. We're excited about this because of the strong shared goals and interests reflected in the AU declaration and the US Feed the Future initiative. These shared goals include concerns for extreme poverty, hunger, inclusive growth, and improved livelihoods. Feed the Future is working in 19 countries and five subregions around the world. Majority of them are in Africa. It is focused in countries and regions where the leaders of those countries and regions are delivering on their commitments and increasing investment in agriculture and food security. As an FTF policy for a country to be identified as a focused country, the country needed to have an externally reviewed national agriculture investment plan and the plans submitted by our country teams were required to demonstrate how and where they were aligned with the national agriculture investment plan. The new AU declaration creates a vision for African agriculture and food security for the period of 2015 to 2025 and significantly deepens the commitments that have been made by each of the African heads of state. This webinar provides us with the opportunity to better understand those commitments and the actions proposed to be taken by the African Union, regional economic communities and countries to implement the declaration. I'd like to introduce our primary speaker, Dr. Abebe Gabriel. He's the director for the African Union Commission Department for Rural Economy and Agriculture. Dr. Abebe has played a lead role in facilitating the consultations and negotiations that led to the development of the declaration, as well as served as a primary architect in developing the strategy and roadmap for implementation of the declaration. This webinar is very timely. It comes after significant consultations have been held with many stakeholders across Africa over the past six months, led by the AUCNN and NAPAD to help identify priority actions to facilitate implementation. Dr. Abebe, let me hand it over to you. We're delighted that you're able to join us from Addis, where you'll be making your presentation from. Julie, thank you, Jeff, uh, for that introduction. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to share um, the perspectives from the African Union Commission uh, side, as well as from, uh, in indeed, the NEPAD planning and coordinating agency uh, viewpoint. We are together in this. Both of us are, for those of you who uh, uh, might not know, uh, both the African Union Commission, which is uh, 
the Secretariat of the African Union uh, and the NEPAD Planning and Coordinating Agency, which is the technical uh, arm of the Commission. Uh, we collaborate on this, among others. I would like to also uh, thank those of you who have joined us this afternoon. It is in the afternoon here in Addis uh, for this webinar. Uh, talking about um, Africa's commitments on agriculture, food security, uh, nutrition, uh, as Jeff quite rightly alluded to, it's very important to um, understand what the commitments are in the first place um, so that we can have clarity on what uh, we, are, we are talking about. It brings us back to 2003 Maputo Declaration on Agriculture, uh, where the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, uh, which is now commonly known as CADEP, was adopted. And uh, the, the, the philosophy behind CADEP is the uh, priority that should be given to the agricultural sector in Africa because of both its direct impact on the livelihood of the majority of uh, the people in Africa uh, for the simple reason that they depend directly on agriculture and also uh, through its effect and impact on the performance of the overall economy in Africa because of its heavy weight. So CADEP was adopted as a framework, even though there are some confusions uh, around whether CADEP has been a, a program or, or a framework. It's a framework. Uh, its function is basically to guide the development and review of policies, strategies, and um, actions by member states. Um, what it brought to the fore, principally, uh, are political commitment and leadership, uh, as well as inclusive participation of all stakeholders. Um, and 10 years on, in 2014, uh, when the African Union Assembly declared the year 2014 as the year of agriculture and food security, also marking the 10th anniversary of CADEP, uh, we used the opportunity to look back and reflect on the progress made, as well as the lessons learned. This week, there was a very important document that was launched by FAO, and it's called Regional Overview of Insecurity. And this is uh, for Africa. And I just want to use some of the figures by way of looking at what progress have we been making over the last a couple of decades. The uh, information that we have in this document shows that food availability has increased by about 12% over the last two decades. Of course, the data covers uh, for Africa south of the Sahara. Uh, undernour undernourishment declined from 33% to 23% over the last two decades. Poverty rate also declined by about 23%. And the message, the key messages uh, of why Africa has made such uh, encouraging progress is because of leadership. And I'm, I'm just reading, I'm making reference to this FAO document, which was launched uh, this Monday. It talks about leadership and political commitment. It talks about stakeholders' participation. And it talks about involvement of the private sector. Uh, these are considered as drivers uh, that have contributed towards such a progress, but also 
as drivers that we should be focusing on in terms, in terms of looking forward. Now, the 2014 Malabo commitments on agriculture that Jeff has mentioned has two important components. The first set talks about the goals, the commitment on specific goals to be achieved by the year 2025. You may consider this as a vision. The second, which is quite interrelated to this, is a commitment to mutual accountability. Now, uh, <clears throat> when we look at the commitments on, on the goals to be achieved, uh, we can summarize, and you can find this on our website, the declaration, the Maputo Declaration on Agriculture, uh, about five kind of substantive uh, commitments. One is on ending hunger. Uh, the second one is boosting intra-African trade in agricultural goods and services. And this is because uh, the evidences indicate that Africa trades more with the rest of the world than uh, within Africa, even though, again, evidences indicate that there is a lot of, uh, there is a big and growing market for agricultural goods and services within Africa. So the target is to at least triple intra Africa trade by 2025. Third is to enhance the contribution of agriculture to economic growth, but more importantly also to a significant poverty reduction objective. And uh, agriculture is expected to contribute to at least half of that contribution to poverty reduction. This varies from country to country. The poverty reduction targets are set by the countries themselves, but what Malabo says is whatever targets the countries are setting for themselves, agriculture should make a high contribution, at least half of that, to, uh, through agricultural growth and transformation. The fourth one is about enhancing resilience uh, of production systems and livelihoods. And this is to respond and to address the high rate of vulnerability of uh, livelihoods and production systems in Africa. Uh, as, as we know, agriculture is amongst the uh, sectors who are uh, climate sensitive and the impact of climate change, in particular droughts and flood, is, has been huge and it continues to be so. And we wanted to address through building and enhancing resilience. So this is one goal. And the fifth one uh, talks about investment finance, enhancing investment finance in agriculture, both public and private. And one of the lessons that we have learned over implementation of CADEP over the last 10 years was that there has been um, a lot of emphasis on mobilizing public investment resources, which is quite right. And Malabo also makes reassertion, reassertion and reaffirmation of the need for public sector to continue to increase spending in agriculture. But Malabo brings this even uh, in terms of leveraging other sources, most uh, importantly, private, private sector finance in agriculture. So we can talk about these five goals to be achieved as commitments. The second set is about mutual accountability. This is very straightforward. The commitment uh, is for uh, African countries to conduct a biennial agricultural review process, to, to conduct this review process every other year, once in two years, um, starting from 2017, and the outcome of that uh, to be reported in the January uh, 2018 session of the, uh, the African Union Assembly to the heads of state and government. And that is going to be the inaugural report. And hence, uh, the report is going to be done every two years on a regular basis. Uh, so it, it, it also uh, makes a commitment to foster alignment, harmonization, and coordination among multi-sectoral efforts and multi-institutional platforms. And this, is, this arose out of realization that 
agriculture cannot afford to be um, the agenda of ministers of agriculture only. The commitments on goals indicate that um, ministries of trade, infrastructure, energy, transport, uh, even health, uh, finance, and so on are equally important. And the challenge is on how to bring these critical uh, sectors around the table for them to co-own and provide co-leadership to the transformation agenda. Uh, another aspect of the mutual accountability commitment is in terms of strengthening national and regional institutional capacities, uh, in particular on knowledge and data generation and management, because we're talking about enhancing planning uh, and policy making, implementation, tracking, monitoring and reporting. And the demand on data is huge. The capacity on the ground in Africa for this is limited. And unless we make a deliberate effort towards addressing this, uh, the other objectives might not be made. So this is also an important component of the commitment on mutual accountability. Following the adoption of Malabo uh, declaration, we went ahead uh, in a, in a, in a very, uh, together with relevant stakeholders through a very consultative process to develop an implementation strategy and roadmap and subsequently a program of work. The uh, strategy and roadmap basically identified and it identifies key strategic action areas, about 11 of them grouped into two categories, and implementation modalities in the roadmap, uh, whereas the program of work based on this implementation strategy outlines uh, the specific activities proposed for implementation. The strategic, uh, the strategy itself has two objectives. The first objective responds directly to the substantive aspect of transforming agriculture and ensuring inclusive growth. So this is the first objective. Uh, the second objective, on the other hand, uh, talks about strengthening systemic capacity for transformation. Um, so the first one we, we may, for simplicity's sake, call it substantive. The second one, uh, we might call it strengthening systemic capacity. Now, uh, to make it easier for us to understand, the first objective deals with issues of, for example, doubling productivity and increased production in a sustainable manner. This is uh, included in the declaration. Enhancing value chains, markets, trade, as well as resilience and strengthening of governance of natural resources. Uh, the second objective, which focuses on strengthening systemic capacity for transformation, dwells much on areas of capacity strengthening for planning, policies and institutional reform, strengthening leadership, coordination and partnerships, knowledge, skills, and agriculture education, which I talked about earlier on, as well as data and statistics, institutionalizing mutual accountability, as well as enhancing investment financing. The, uh, we have proposed, uh, and now it has been uh, validated, uh, an implementation modality having the implementation strategy and the program of work is one thing, but uh, in view of the multitude of institutions and stakeholders that are involved, that should be involved in implementation, uh, a clear cl clarification of the implementation modalities is very much important. Uh, the first thing to clarify is that implementation is a national responsibility, first and foremost. So it's about national ownership and national leadership. Uh, 
as I said earlier on, implementation also is a multi-sectoral responsibility. Yes, it's the ministries of agriculture who um, are the holders of the portfolio, but other sectors are equally important. Uh, within government, we are talking about infrastructure, trade industry, health, education, and so on. But also beyond government, uh, we have producers, the, the smallholder producers, the private sector, civil society, and so on. And therefore, there is a strong need for uh, strengthening multi-sectoral co-leadership, engagement, and coordination. As an implementation modality, also we have to uh, recognize that there are regional and continental institutions, including our own uh, African Union Commission, NEPAD agency, as well as regional economic communities with uh, mandates. And the role of these institutions is basically to provide catalytic support functions and they facilitate linkages to continental and regional strategies and plans, thus contributing to the strengthening of the systemic capacities at national level. And we have an important uh, stakeholder and, and partners group, and these are development and technical partners. They have important roles, and it is mainly to provide the strategic support to the implementation uh, at different levels, more importantly at national level, in an aligned and coordinated manner. And a system of regular review and tracking progress as part of mutual accountability helps us to tie these things together. Uh, I have already talked about the relationship between the Malabo Declaration together with the CADEP result framework that guides the uh, tracking, tracking of progress and the mutual accountability, as well as the implementation strategy and roadmap and the program of work that arose out of it. In terms of uh, proposed activities, we can talk about four categories. Uh, the first one is the whole issue of policy development, formulation, and institutional reform. If we want to bring about those desired changes, it will never happen without the right kinds of policies and institutions. And therefore, policy and institutional change and reform is absolutely necessary. This is number one. The second is, we have said already, the focus is implementation. And therefore, naturally, we should talk about investment program design and implementation. That's where the National Agricultural Investment Plan, the NIPES, come into picture, which Jeff was talking about earlier on. The third aspect of it is the whole issue of capacity building and coordination. This is very, very crucial. And the fourth one, and this is linked to the mutual accountability, and it is about monitoring and evaluation, about data and knowledge management. So these are the proposed activities categorized into four. In terms of early action, uh, and I'm talking about 2015-2016 priority action areas, uh, we have identified a number of uh, action areas, uh, starting from engaging countries on appraisal of their NIPES. Uh, the many, most, most of the countries have developed investment plans through a CADE process. And now because of Malabo, things are going to change and they should be building on what exists already uh, in member states. And uh, appraisal of those knives is going to be uh, undertaken. The second is about the design of the biennial agricultural review cycle. Uh, I said the first review is going to take place in 2017 and we are only two years left, uh, and therefore we need to finalize this design as soon as possible. In fact, our plan is to fi finalize it before the end of this year. Uh, the third aspect is the programmatic support for implementation. Uh, once 
the knives have been reviewed. We need to make sure that countries are provided with the necessary support to enhance implementation. And then uh, one aspect which, which is crucial, and this is also one of the lessons that we have learned, uh, we need to harmonize and develop communication strategy around the agenda. I'm going into more details um, in terms of uh, actions, proposed actions at country level. Uh, we want to clarify major streams of work and instruments that are in place at the country and regional levels. Uh, this will help us identify gaps and then develop options to ensure that the necessary services and support systems are available for implementation. We need to build technical networks. This thing will not work without putting in place, capitalizing on existing networks, which are already there, but we need to build that network around thematic topics, uh, which reflect the, the Malabo commitments and, and its implementation strategy. We have been uh, working with some of our partners with a view to identifying and agreeing on lead technical partners <clears throat> who have institutions with relevant mandates, institutions that have programs on the ground, institutions that can um, confidently co-lead uh, some of the aspects and coordinate at country and regional levels. And of course, we have now started working on the design and establishment of a framework for the biennial review. Uh, we, are also, we have also started refining, in fact, we are finalizing the communication strategy. And uh, lastly, we have started engaging our partners, including governments, to secure the financial commitments to support implementation uh, at country level, as well as regional level. In terms of detailed actions, there are several actions. I will just very quickly uh, mention the, uh, the, the, their titles. I understand that um, the soft copies and the hard copies will be made available to uh, the participants, so it should be easy to follow. In terms of detailed activi act activities, we are talking about building and strengthening capacity We've uh, temporarily lost audio, so please excuse us for a moment while we try to get Abebe's audio back. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, Abebe, we can hear you now, yes. Uh, can you... Uh, tell me where you lost me, at what stage? Oh. Um, maybe only 30 seconds or so of your, con of your last content. <clears throat> okay, I was talking about detailed activities uh, at the country level. Uh, I was outlining about three of them. I'll just rehash very quickly. Uh, the the four, one was building and strengthening capacity for evidence-based planning, implementation, review, and dialogue. The second, I talked about review and implementation of policies and institutional reforms to strengthen leadership, management, and technical capacity. Thirdly, I spoke about strengthening local ownership and leadership to champion agriculture through CADEP. 
and align coordination and implementation partnerships through strengthening multi-stakeholder coordination platforms. Fourthly, I spoke about enhancing skills and knowledge <clears throat> and agricultural education. Uh, and the fifth was on strengthening data and statistics for evidence-based planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, and review process. The sixth was establishing and institutionalizing mutual accountability mechanisms with regular peer reviews and strong dialogue platforms. Seven is to identify and enhance innovative financing models for increased public and private sector finance for investment in agriculture along the value chains. Yeah, so these are some of the uh, detailed actions uh, that uh, we need to launch in the countries. And uh, talking of country ownership and country engagement, uh, last week we had held a retreat with permanent secretaries of agriculture uh, of uh, African Union member states together with the CADEP focal persons. And the purpose was to consult and agree on the necessary steps to be taken to implement the commitments, the Malabo commitments. Uh, the retreat appreciated and came to agreement actually as by way of uh, adopting a communique, joint communique on the broader areas of operationalization as well as immediate next steps to be undertaken. So the proposed activities which I had earlier on outlined have been validated. Um, implementation arrangements and the review process have been agreed. Now each country will, as, as necessary and as relevant, depending on their situation, will embark on working on their respective NIPES, the investment plans, to respond to the commitments and to embark on the review process. In October this year, uh, we are going to convene a ministerial conference. Uh, it's called the African Union Specialized Technical Committee, STC, uh, on agriculture, rural development, water and environment. Uh, so this brings together sector leaders, ministers from related agriculture related ministries. And it is a kind of organ, it's an organ of the African Union. So it's a policy organ of the Union. Uh, one of the things which we will table for that meeting is the operationalization, the agreement that was reached by the permanent secretaries, as well as the review cycle, the instruments and methodology of the review uh, for adoption by the ministers. Of course, their report will be submitted to the January same summit of the African Union for endorsement. So in terms of country engagement, we are <coughs> making some he headway. Uh, we, we understand that we are late. Malabo was adopted last year in June in 2014 and uh, we have been working on the, the, the strategy, the program of work, engaging our partners and so on. Uh, but last week's retreat with the permanent secretaries was the first direct interaction to, co to, to undertake conversation with them on operationalization of Malabo commitments. And it was a very... Uh, productive, very fruitful uh, retreat. Now, uh, I was also asked to talk about expectations from the donors, donor expectations vis-a-vis -vis country engagement. I've talked at length about um, the country ownership and country leadership of uh, these commitments. Uh, that is very important, but equally important is uh, the involvement and active participation of all the stakeholders, including the donors. Uh, the expectation from donors is straightforward. I'm not going to talk, uh, going to be very innovative in this regard. Uh, it's, it's common sense. First is 
to align their support to the priorities as defined by the countries themselves. Uh, we have already said that countries, number one, should prioritize agriculture. Number two, uh, prioritize uh, the Malabo commitments because they are going to be measured. The progress is going to be measured. Uh, and there is a positive feedback from the countries that this is going to be so. So we would expect our partners, donors, to also support this process, not to replace it or to undermine it or to uh, engage in a parallel process. So this is a very important, strong uh, comment. I must uh, use this opportunity to to appreciate uh, the effort of the um, USAID. Uh, Jeff Hill has been very supportive of this event, this, this uh, approach, and already uh, we have seen some progress in that, and we want to encourage. The second one is we want, we, we also expect donors to coordinate uh, amongst themselves, you know, their, their efforts for them to work together, uh, and that would facilitate the country engagement itself. It would really ease the burden on the part of the countries to work with that kind of coordinated approach. And it would be good if uh, some of our donors take lead in terms of uh, motivating and um, encouraging other partners to come around the table to support this agenda. The third, perhaps, is to agree to work within the framework of and the parameters of mutual accountability. We have developed the CADEP result framework, and this framework was developed in co continuous consultative process. Our partners have been part of this, and we expect now, in terms of operationalization, our partners to agree now to work within such a framework. The fourth one is in terms of uh, the efforts of our donors to work, to work towards leveraging investment finance, both public and private. <clears throat> uh, already there are some progress in this area, but we want to learn from those and expand it. Um, some of our donors have uh, some experience on how this can be done. Uh, that platform, the donor platform, which I, I was talking about, which would facilitate coordination among themselves, can also be used for lesson learning among themselves on how um, the public and private finance, investment finance, can be leveraged through the actions, deliberate actions by our partners. Uh, sorry, it seems I have taken more time than uh, I was given, but I would like to thank you. This uh, ends my presentation. Julie, over to you. And so we will go ahead and dive right into a few questions for Abebe. Um, beginning with a question from... Uh, Samson Conlin from USAID Ghana, uh, who wanted to know what the linkages are between the Biennial Agriculture Review and the JSRs. Um, how will those relate or, or change going forward? Uh, do, do I respond to the questions one by one, or do you want to collect more questions and for me to respond together? Uh, I think we'll we'll start off on one by one, if that's all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the relationship between JSR and the biennial review process. Uh, well, the biennial review is going to build on uh, the ongoing work on JSR. It's not going to replace it. Uh, if you May, the biennial uh, review process, it, it has a very specific objective. It's not going to be a very complicated review. Its objective is to, uh, to mobilize 
and sustain political uh, uh, leadership and commitment. The JSRs are not or have not been uh, communicated formally to the African Union Assembly of Heads of State and the Government. They are undertaken and, and they have uh, um, their own purposes. But the biennial review is a deliberate attempt to link tracking of progress in implementation of specific commitments in this respect, the Malabo commitments, uh, and report to the very assembly of heads of state and government who have adopted those declarations. So the, the, the biennial review will build on and refine the JSRs, but they are, they, are, uh, they, are, they are related, but they are different. Great, thank you for that response. Uh, we've also had a question from Nargiza Ludgate, a PhD student with uh, the Ingen in Ingenious Project, um, who asked, how is gender in integrated into CADAP, into the CADAP framework? And what are the specific mechanisms to make governments commit to gender issues in agriculture? Um. I think it will be easier for me to, um, to talk about how uh, the Malabo commitments capture gender considerations. In uh, the run up to Malabo, as we were working uh, in preparation for the formulation of the declaration, uh, there has been a number of consultations involving different stakeholders and including women groups. So issues like gender, like environment, like use were deliberately considered as cross-cutting cross issues. That's why you don't see them amongst the specific commitments that I have outlined, which you will find in the declaration. These are cross-cutting. You should be able to find them everywhere. But if you open the declaration itself, under each one of the provisions, you will find, and this is also to be captured in the tracking of progress and reporting, how and in what ways can the gender differences be addressed, either through enhancing uh, for example, in terms of ending hunger goal or boosting trade or resilience building or impact of the agricultural growth and transformation on poverty reduction, on, on access to finance, access to productive resources, and so on. So Malabo makes a very explicit treatment of why and how gender aspects should be addressed. So this is an integrated aspect of the whole declaration. And of course, uh, when we talk about operationalization of uh, Malabo commitments, we are talking about such kinds of uh, differentiated responses. Right. Good Thank you very much for that response. Um, all right, we have another question from Jocelyn Sonko from Soros Economic Development Fund in New York in the United States. A similar question to that of expectations of donors by countries. What are expectations of the private sector relative to this framework strategy or roadmap? Do, are there um, any different expectations for the private sector? expectation from the private sector. Uh, we have different kinds of private sectors in African agriculture. Um, the first one is the very producers themselves, the smallholders themselves. These are the majority of the producers in their private sector. The second is the domestic private sector who are engaged in different kinds of agribusiness, agro-industries. The third one is the uh, uh, the uh, foreign investors, 
you know, to use um, a, a simpler terminology. Now, what we are trying to capitalize on uh, in terms of operationalization of Malabo, uh, we believe that this is transformational and therefore the discussion should um, include transformation of the product, not just increased productivity and production. That's where uh, along the value chain, uh, because that's where a lot of jobs can be created and a lot of incomes can be generated. And these are some things which cannot happen just by the action of the public sector or the smallholder farmers themselves. Uh, there is a lot of potential. There is a lot of market. It's going to great, uh, grow, uh, actually, over time uh, for agribusiness and agro-industries. The agro-industries are the ones which are um, being given emphasis for development in the future. So the expectation of the private sector is that private sector would uh, engage in a productive, which is going to be rewarding, we believe, uh, engagement by uh, investing in the agricultural transformation uh, agenda. But the role of the public sector is something which we emphasize to facilitate this to happen. For this to happen, there is a lot of things to be done by the public sector in terms of uh, improving the big business climate uh, and reducing the cost of doing business in Africa. Uh, we have already started creating platforms for uh, the private sector to interact with the public sector, uh, the private sector from foreign sources as well as from the local to come together, work uh, around common um, agenda and concrete work uh, with each delivering on their respective uh, expectations. This is what we have been trying to do through, through, for example, the new alliance, the USAID, Jeff knows it very well, uh, also with Grow Africa Initiative, so to bring together the private sector and the public sector uh, so that investment uh, in agriculture can increase for African agriculture to play its role of uh, increased productivity as well as uh, expansion of jobs and incomes to uh, reduce poverty and bring about prosperity, uh, shared prosperity. Um, great, thank you so much, Abebe, for that very thorough response. I'm going to pass the microphone over to Jeff Hill for a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abebe. Um, I, you, you made a very uh, thorough presentation in terms of describing some of the architecture for supporting implementation moving forward. And you've you've made actually I think a very you know clear uh, presentation to say that that moving forward the intent is to build upon the structures that have actually you know been created in the earlier generation of CADAP at the continental, regional, and country level. Uh, but you've also actually. Um, presented that there are going to be changes in the architecture for supporting implementation. The new commitments that have been made, you know, are really demanding, you know, engaging uh, other, you know, technical audiences and support groups uh, to advance the various issues. And you've you've laid out, you know, a the intent in. Uh, as an early set of uh, actions to support implementation, the intent to develop the technical networks, you know, around major thematic uh, topics, reflecting the commitments and the uh, implementation strategy and and roadmap uh, plan, um, and and so you know those technical networks, uh, you know, will be you know an additional feature, you know, that to support implementation and becoming uh, a very important, it appears. 
uh, moving forward. Can you clarify in terms of the inclusion in those technical networks? Will they, you know, be aimed at actually bringing together the the different technical agencies that are currently working on the various issues, including the private sector, civil society? Will they will they be giving voice to these various constituencies in helping to frame, you know, the support services moving forward? Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> yes, you are you are quite right. Um, one of the things which we um, want to capitalize on is uh, on building on um, on initiatives uh, and capacities that already exist uh, in the countries. Uh, we have already said that implementation is a country's responsibility, it's a country's. Uh, after all, Malabo commitment itself is a commitment by member states, by the heads of state of member states. So um, it's, it's their commitment and operationalization is going to be their responsibility. Uh, what um, institutions such as, um, you know, continental institutions, regional institutions, technical institutions do is to support that process. I think this is very important. So the question is how can we, um, position ourselves uh, to provide that support, that technical support, uh, in a manner that facilitates, not duplicates, but facilitates and builds on what has already proved to be um, promising experience. So the technical networks, this is a lesson, for example, we have learned from um, the pillar leading institutions. You remember during the CADEP the earlier years of CADEP, uh, because CADEP has four pillars, uh, some few institutions were designated uh, as pillar lead institutions, you know, to provide that technical leadership. But uh, soon we come to we came to re realize that these kind of things cannot be laid by kind of one or two pillars. Uh, the reality is much 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 more complex. And we moved towards, uh, Jeff, as you know, the uh, what we call KEYS, the knowledge information skill approach, basically um, focusing on the capacities of countries, what capacities there are within the countries them themselves, and build on those capacities. So now these technical clusters, technical networks, uh, one of the reasons why they are different is they directly respond to Malabo. Malabo has defined their areas of uh, work. If it is ending hunger and, and, and malnutrition, so it's, it's very clear. Resilience, it's, it's very clear. Boosting trade and so on. But we realize that there is already a lot that is happening in different countries in Africa there are different technical agencies that are already active in Africa. Our role should be how can we uh, leverage such uh, capacities through building and coordinating these networks. Uh, as far as the African Union Commission is concerned, we are trying to position ourselves in terms of even reorganizing the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture uh, around cluster clusters so that um, we'll be able to build our capacity to be able to lead and coordinate those technical networks. And the same thing is true for NEPAD. So we are going to be following an approach which is inclusive. And in fact, we, has, we have always been inclusive. CADEP has always been inclusive. Uh, the, the stakeholders, the private sector, the civil society organizations, the technical agencies, they will continue to be uh, involved actively. And in fact, as one of my presentation slides uh, suggest, we even seek uh, a, a kind of co-leadership and co-coordination, uh, taking note of or recognizing the expertise uh, that already exist in some of those technical agencies. 
So yes, uh, Jeff, I can um, assure you that it's going to be very inclusive, but those networks uh, are going to be um, started with perhaps those few who, are, or who have already demonstrated uh, some work and results on the ground. Yeah. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, we've had a lot more questions come in, so we, we appreciate your attention um, and your willingness to respond to these questions. It's extremely helpful to our audience here today. Um, Amari Alayu, or yes, Ayalu, um, emphasized that unsafe foods can impede the lives of millions of people in Africa and national economies, um, and stresses the need for access to safe food. Uh, he asks, Dr. Abebe, could you shed some light on AUC and member states' actual and potential focus on addressing food safety challenges during the phase of implementation of Malabo Declaration commitments? Thank you uh, for that question. Well, this particular uh, question actually uh, shows how Malabo actually speaks to the different uh, aspects of the agricultural and trade <laughs> um, aspects. Now, food safety, when we talk about uh, improved nutrition, uh, which is a goal in Malabo, we cannot achieve it without addressing the challenges of uh, food safety. Uh, also, when you talk about in boosting intra-Africa trade as a goal, it's not to just increase the volume of trade of um, whatever food quality there might be. It's going to be based on standards, set of standards, uh, that are going to be regulated uh, on food safety. We are working with um, different agencies, both within Africa and from without, on strengthening the sanitary and phytosanitary uh, aspects as well as food safety uh, aspects of uh, both the agriculture and uh, trade and health uh, aspects of this transformation agenda. So, yes, when we go to the countries, uh, as I spoke earlier on in our interaction with the permanent secretaries, and this is going to continue, as they review their national agriculture investment plans, uh, these are some of the things which should come out very clearly. It's not possible to enhance trade without addressing issues of food safety, even within Africa, uh, let alone uh, enhancing export, food export. So, uh, yes, Malabo responds to this. We have, I'm very glad to say that the partnership for aflatoxin control uh, that uh, is hosted by the African Union Commission, in fact, it is one of now the flagship programs of the African Union, uh, is already here in, within my department. Uh, we have uh, a full-fledged institution based in Cameroon, Yaoundé. It's called Inter-Africa Phytosanitary Council and deals with issues of phytosanitary. Uh, and we have also another big office in Nairobi, and uh, in, in, again in my department, uh, that deals with the animal, animal health issues and they are working currently on institutionalizing food safety mechanisms. So we have taken uh, a very bold and explicit uh, stance on addressing this important challenge uh, because it is at the center of the quality of food that we should eat, nutrition, as well as on the capacity of African countries to trade both amongst themselves as well as with the rest of the world. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
We had a question from Patricia Rosoka Masanganis from USAID Southern Africa. Many countries are not able to invest enough resources into the agriculture sector to get the growth that can contribute to ending hunger and malnutrition. What is going to be done differently now in terms of creating discipline and support to achieve the targets by 2025? <clears throat> yeah, uh, if, we, if we look at the, uh, the data on public spending on agriculture over the last decade or so, uh, the public expenditure on agriculture has been increasing on average by about 7% per annum. Uh, on the other hand, total expenditure, public expenditure during the same period of time has been increasing by about 9% per annum, which means that even though there has been a positive trend um, in terms of growth of public spending on agriculture, uh, the pace at which it has been increasing uh, was less than the total expenditure. So the observation is quite right. Uh, Maputo declaration itself puts a minimum of 10% of budget expenditure to be allocated to agriculture. Uh, and this was to be achieved by 2015. The data shows that less than 10 countries have achieved this one. But we are very much encouraged to see that uh, countries have been, uh, even though they haven't reached this level, many of them have been allocating an increasing um, proportion of their budget, even though it is at, at a lower level. So that's why Malabo talks again about the relevance of enhancing both public and private investment in agriculture. And it again recalls this 10% allocation, at least 10% allocation to agriculture, uh, makes a recommitment towards it, but even goes beyond. It talks about the quality of the investment, however small it has been. Where does it go? And how do we ensure that this increased investment um, brings about the desired change. This is a task which is actually a challenge for us, institutions like the African Union Commission and NEPAD, to make sure that we follow up on these commitments. And one of the things to do this, and you have talked about how can we encourage countries, governments, to do more in terms of allocating resources to agriculture, is to use this instrument of the biennial review process and reporting it. In a way, we're going to come up with a kind of scorecard where the performance of each country is going to be measured and reported and distributed and the presentation would be made in a meeting that heads of state and government attend in, in a summit. And that, uh, I can tell you, can be uh, a very good booster because this is a kind of peer review, and the heads of state, uh, they would like to be seen that they actual, actually demonstrate what they have committed to. So we will provide data and good data uh, to measure the progress made in terms of allocation of public resources, among other things. And we hope that that will, in fact, because of great advocacy, a lot of advocacy over the last several years, since the adoption of uh, CADEP in Maputo in 2003, we have seen an increase, as I said, in allocation of resources to agriculture. So this thing is a continuous process. We have to do more. We understand the challenges, but we still uh, believe that uh, the, the future is, uh, and it should be better. Great, thank you so much. We had a question from Dave Hansen from Ohio State University, who stressed that capacity building in higher education for agriculture is critical for development of national agriculture and food sectors. 
So he's wondering what actions are the AUC and NEPAD taking to increase attention to higher education? Uh, is this part of your agenda? Yes. Uh, actually, yes, it is part of our agenda. <clears throat> um, when you get a copy of my presentation, uh, actually, you will find the, uh, the area of higher education institutions building the capacity of uh, tertiary education and technical uh, and vocational training institutions is actually uh, one of uh, the components of the agenda. But it doesn't mean that uh, we have not been doing uh, anything on that. We have to look at uh, another strategy as part of this. Uh, Malabo. Malabo is just one focusing on what I had presented. Uh, we have uh, a science, technology, and innovation strategy that was also adopted that focuses on uh, agricultural education, uh, including tertiary education, uh, as well as research and innovation. Um, one of the pillars of CADEP is, is, is called Ford's Pillar, is promotion of agricultural research, innovation, uh, and, and extension. And the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, FARA, that's based in Accra, together with uh, the sub-regional organizations, Asarika, Koraf, uh, have been the pillar lead institutions. Uh, and in fact, uh, a, a strategy for driving that process was developed and adopted uh, before Malabo. Uh, and what I called the science, technology, innovation, uh, also together with NEPAD. NEPAD has also programs uh, on this. We have been working with institutions of higher learning in Africa. There are consortium of uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, the Roof Forum, for example, we have signed a uh, memorandum of understanding on how uh, we can work together on this. Uh, so, yes, it is uh, not only a part of the agenda, but also it is at the center of it. Thank you. We have uh, just a few more questions for you before we wrap up. The next question is from Courtney Buck on the BFS uh, policy team at USAID. She has a question about inclusiveness. How are countries being encouraged to be more inclusive in their policy processes? Will the biennial review and the JSR incorporate indicators for representation and inclusion of non-state actors? Um. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. The inclusive inclusiveness of different stakeholders is not something that uh, we are creating, you know, just because of Malabo. As I said, this is one of the good lessons that we have learned uh, over implementation of CADEP over the last decade or so. When we had um, worked with countries uh, who have signed their compacts, more than 40 countries have signed their compact, CADEP compacts, and those compacts have been developed through a consultative process. Uh, so it is, it's a, CADEP is also a set of principles, uh, including the principle of inclusiveness. The countries have already gone through that. They have uh, taken that as an important lesson. It's not only countries, meaning governments, but also the different stakeholders, the civic society organizations, the farmers organizations, the private sector uh, players, they are also aware, uh, because they have been part of that at different levels. Of course, the quality and the level of engagement might vary uh, depending on specific situation of the countries and the capacities of those stakeholders. But they have already, they, 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 are, they have developed uh, a kind of minimum capacity to make that kind of demand uh, and take part 
they have expressed this in different fora. Um, so we conti will continue to work with member states as well as other stakeholders that this inclusiveness should continue it, because it is a CADE principle. It's a central uh, principle of the CADE process to which uh, the heads of state have against Rumalabo uh, re-committed themselves to. Yes, the indicators definitely should indicate, should have some kind of measure uh, of the level and quality of inclusiveness uh, of uh, the review. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, we have a question from Kedar Mankad from the One Campaign. What steps does the African Union plan to take on strengthening land governance and security of land tenure rights? Will there be a commitment to implement the AU framework and guidelines on land in Africa as part of your efforts? Uh, well, again, this is uh, this is not something that we are going to start now. Uh, the the framework and guidelines on land policy uh, that was adopted through a declaration uh, by AU declaration in 2009 um, has been there, and the land policy initiative. Uh, this is a joint initiative of the African Union Commission the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and the African Development Bank uh, has been uh, trying to work with member states towards operationalization of that particular uh, policy initiative uh, that through that declaration. So strengthening land governance. There was a, an important document that was launched um, last year as part of the 2014 Year of Agriculture and Security and this is the set of principles uh, and guidelines on, uh, on strengthening land governance, in particular on um, responsible investment on large-scale land-based investments, because that has been uh, an area of concern by, by many. And we thought that we, we should be playing a constructive and important role in helping countries to uh, engage in a kind of contracts with uh, different kinds of private sector in a transparent uh, and um, inclusive process uh, that would result in a win-win uh, situation for all, in particular uh, towards addressing the challenges of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the people on whose livelihood depend um, on those kinds of lands. So we have a lot of roles to play. We have a strategy on how we should be taking that forward. Uh, there is a secretariat uh, at, the, at the moment. It's housed within the Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa. It's called the Land Policy Initiative Secretariat. I would like to invite uh, participants to visit their website. Uh, apparently, I happen to be the chair of the steering committee of the Land Policy Initiative. So. Uh, I'm aware of what uh, has been taking place since. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, we want to be respectful for your time, and we are uh, so incredibly grateful for all of your responses to these questions. To our attendees, I think that we'll uh, begin our wrap-up process now. We're sorry that we weren't able to get to every single question, but we greatly appreciate your engagement, um, and we're glad that we were able to get to many of them. Uh, so, Dr. Gabriel, we wanted to give you a chance if there are any closing thoughts you would like uh, to express to our audience um, based on the questions you heard or just any final comments. Uh, we'd love to hear what you'd have to say before we wrap up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Julie. Um, just one, uh, one point which I think uh, is also very important. When I look at uh, some of the questions that were raised, um, they are related to um, inclusiveness. And I think this is a key word. I know I have been speaking to people uh, who are uh, involved in supporting the implementation of 
um, strategies, policies, um, projects on the ground in different capacities. Uh, so I'm not surprised if uh, this question comes now and again, that of the inclusiveness. I also understand the concern. Uh, what I would like to say is that the African Union Commission and the NEPAD planning and coordinating agency who are responsible for spearheading this process, uh, this agenda, the agenda of agricultural development and transformation in Africa. Uh, we are very much committed towards making sure that uh, all the stakeholders uh, are actually involved, not just participation, but co-own the process. Um, and we also expect them to uh, be as inclusive as possible at their different levels. Uh, if it is at the country level, um, now I, I can see a lot of uh, participants are from USAID. Um, USAID has been supporting uh, member states in different uh, areas. So when they engage uh, the countries, uh, I, I would like to encourage them to also be as inclusive as possible. Uh, I also would like to uh, encourage them to uh, engage the countries themselves. Jeff was uh, very helpful actually when he, as part of his introduction, uh, he has uh, given us some reassurance that that is what is happening actually on the ground. Uh, but I would like to encourage uh, USAID uh, colleagues also to work with other partners uh, along the same kind of approach. Uh, because this inclusiveness, you know, the African Union, uh, is, it is a multi, a, an intergovernmental agency, but also it is a union of the people, not just the governments. And we want to make sure that the voices of the people, the voices of the different stakeholders are not only heard, but also acted upon. That's why we keep talking about and emphasizing on mutual accountability. And we're very serious about it. Uh, this is what I would like to say, and I would like to thank uh, our facilitator, uh, Julie, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for inviting me to share my views with uh, a number of you know, participants. I'm so happy I can see some of the, the feedback. Uh, I'm very happy to note that um, uh, I had made some clarity on uh, the subject that I, um, I have been coordinating over the last few years. Uh, I hope this is not going to be the last time we should be uh, speaking to. I look forward to perhaps a presentation from one of the participants so that I can also ask some of the questions. So thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Abebe, thank you very much. Uh, you've given us a lot of your time here at this uh, important uh, you know, juncture here, just as you're you know, doing preparation for the financing for development meetings that will be taking place in Addis next week. So we know you're deeply um, engaged in those preparations, and thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, for sharing uh, these insights and these plans with uh, with all of us. Um, uh, I think this is going to be very helpful uh, to many of us in being able to frame uh, some of our uh, support and uh, next steps there. Uh, so again, thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, seeing you soon. And I'd thank like you so to much, echo Jeff. Just you. thanks and just say have a wonderful evening. And uh, to all of our participants who have joined, uh, thank you very much thank for you. your participation. Right. Please fill out our exit polls, if you wouldn't mind, before you uh, leave us today. And we will send you an email uh, within uh, about one week, letting you know when the recording and all of the other post-event resources are available. So thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and sign off, and we'll see you at future webinars. Thank you.